pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you. Mr. McCulloch, can we get a roll call, please? Mr. Simonero. Mrs. Hamill. Mr. Kurtz. Mr. McCulloch here. Mr. McLaughlin. Mr. Potts. Here. Mr. Shaheen. Here. Mr. Wolf. Here. And Mr. Basil. Here. Okay, uh, under announcements, um, any board member have any uh, edits to the agenda? Anything you want to add, change? Okay, seeing none, um, for the benefit of the public, we'll be having an executive session to discuss personnel after this meeting. Also, the rules for participation are in the inside jacket cover of the uh, agenda. Um, having said that, are there any public comments on items on the agenda? Okay, seeing none, move on to the superintendent's report. Thank you, Mr. Basil. Just want to start with the opening of schools. We are already into our third week of the school year, and we've had, uh, thankfully, a rather smooth start to the school year. Uh, the feedback in our administrative reorganization has been uh, extremely positive, uh, so we're, we're, we're very happy with that and the way everyone has started in their new positions. Um, all of our athletic teams and activities are well into their fall season, and obviously classes are in full swing. Still have to remember that it's the third week. That's almost hard to believe already. Uh, the elementary and middle school parent orientation meetings have already taken place, and the high school parent orientation meeting takes place this Thursday night. Also, like to provide just a brief update on the collection of our activity fees. All of our high school fees have been collected for athletics and the band. That's at the high school. The deadline for club payments is still out there. That's October 1st. We are still collecting for middle school sports, and the deadline for them is tomorrow. Um, we also still need to collect for middle school band and chorus next month. So at our October meeting, I'll be able to give the board a better idea of where we stand on the final amount of revenue collected for that. Dr. Otto, what assurance do we have that 100% of the activity fees for clubs are being collected? The reason I'm asking this is I know that at least three individuals never paid last year. And they just, it just, they just the, the advisors just didn't collect the money. Yeah, we, we've tightened up on that. We have... Um, Mrs. Goss has already met with all of the club advisors, and we have a new system in place to make sure that nobody falls through the cracks. She has rosters and, and check-offs to make sure that everybody's paying. She's not here tonight. She's at a soccer game. Okay. Are, are we still accepting cash? Are we accepting checks? Is, how are we tracking the money? Uh, I'd have to turn to Danielle for that. I know you're accepting checks because I sent them in. I would assume that whatever pet form, yes. other outside of credit cards, you're cash in or accept cash, but a receipt. Well, that's my point. Was it's it's easy to track a, a check right. or an online payment or however a credit card, but when someone starts handling cash and there's no receipts being issued by, I guess the coaches or whoever else is doing this, then that's how I, I can imagine some people falling through the cracks. They get checked off when they're not supposed to be checked off and. Nobody knows whose cash that was supposed to go for. And Honestly, I don't think that was the problem last year. I think what happened was, is with it being a new process, I, I, I don't think the club advisors had a full understanding of what their responsibility was. These in particular with the language club. We've made that very clear this year, that it is part of their responsibility to make sure they collect that fee. And, and, and the only, and again, the only reason I know it is one of my checks was never cashed, and my daughter found it in my locker room, she cleaned it out, and I ended up giving it to God. And then I found out there were many others, uh, many, there was a handful of others that I know of that just didn't. And it was you know, language clubs and some of the other club activities. So the sports were pretty hard because you know who's playing the sport, you know who's wrestling, you know who's on the football team, and you can run down that list. And some of the clubs, you know, their attendance and membership records aren't uh, as stringent as the sports clubs are. But by the end of next month, we'll have a, a, a much better handle on that and uh, be able to give you. Um, Again, Mrs. Goss would, or Miss Goss would be able to hear, give a report, but she has a soccer game tonight. So we can, I'll get answers to those questions and have them ready for the next time we meet. Okay. That's it for the opening of schools. Welcome back, everybody. The, the year is in full swing. <clears throat> Item B, um, we have been asked to host the PA Music Educators District 10 Orchestra this year. It's a good event from January 10th through the 12th, 2013 at our high school. We actually hosted it last year for elementary. It was actually right here in this auditorium. Uh, Mr. Hankel and Mr. McAdams are asking for the board's endorsement for this activity. 
our high school has to meet certain space requirements to hold the event, and it does. And to begin the planning process, the organization needs my approval and also the board's endorsement which be in the form of a signature uh, to host this activity. I support this activity myself as it provides a great opportunity to showcase our school and community. It also brings many, many people to the community and uh, multiple school districts uh, for those three days. I'd like to read the letter that we've actually received uh, into the minutes. On behalf of the Daniel Boone Area School District, we would like to formally submit a request to host this year's PMEA, Pennsylvania Music Educators Association District 10 Orchestra Festival. The event is scheduled to run from Thursday, January 10th through Saturday, January 12th, 2013. The necessary space and host requirements have been reviewed and feel that this would be a great opportunity for our school and community. We look forward to starting the planning process for the students of PMEA District 10 this year. Signed by Mr. McAdams, Mr. Hankel, myself, and hopefully if you guys endorse it, uh, we'll move on and, and begin to plan for that to be here in Daniel Boone. Is, is the high school available? I mean, when I yes, it's not. Uh, we've already okay, cleared yeah, all that. No other activities will be. Nope. Okay. Do we need a formal vote on that? I don't know that you need a vote. I just, if you would endorse it, we'll get a signature and we can move on with it. Obviously, we have plenty of parking. There is. That's why they come. They look at all that and um, and they, they, they've chosen. Uh, again, um, they did do the elementary run. This auditorium was packed with people from all over the county. And I, I'm not sure what the the region for PMEA is. I think it extends beyond the county line. You, would you know that, Mr. Wolf? Uh, I, I don't. Mr. Hankel, would you happen to know? Does that go beyond just the county? It does go beyond Berks County. I think it's a great idea. I mean, I don't see any result. So we'll sign that. off on that, and we'll move forward with that. So that concludes my report under the opening uh, of school. Any board members have a problem with that? Sure. sure. Right. Everybody's in favor. I have no problem. Oh. Okay. And we also do that Mr. Smith has done prior to We're ready to go. Thank you very much, board members. Appreciate that. And you certainly would be invited to that. I generally... Uh, at their concluding event on Saturday, offer some opening comments from the, on behalf of the of the school district. Okay, great, thanks. Good initiative on on your part to uh, and Mr. McAdams' part yep. to thank Mr. Hankel as well. And Mr. Hankel, thank you for bringing this to the school district. Hopefully, we'll get it. Um, moving on, curriculum instruction, uh, Mr. Sheen. Well, the, the meeting right now is scheduled for the fourth, but the two of us may have a conflict with that date, so maybe moving it to Wednesday. Uh, that if there is no Did you guys meet this month? No, we did not. Okay. Meeting school. We, had, we wanted to get things rolling first, get the teachers, because unfortunately, I mean, unfortunately they do attend it, and we, they had a lot going on, so we want to get that going. And there's a number of things. We want to get a couple of chairs in, talk about how they're going to handle the diversity issue, um, and um, talk about uh, some of our scores that came out of the AP exam, <clears throat> our expectations moving forward as a board uh, with uh, some of the subjects that are lacking behind state and national averages. Sounds good. Any questions for Mr. Sheehan? No, we have nothing from the administration other than that we're, we'll put some things on the agenda as he discussed. I do want to mention that um, Mr. Miller and I are, are working with uh, resurrecting the diversity committee. Mr. Miller, what date is that this month? So the 27th we'll be getting back together and moving forward with the initiatives for this year. Now, is that going to be hosted by the individual that we hired? No, no, no. We're on our own. That's my thought. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're we're ready to we're ready to walk. We're ready to go. Any questions on the diversity committee by board members? Okay, great. Any other comments from board members? I see none. Any comments from the public on curriculum instruction issues? For that matter, diversity. Okay. Uh, buildings and grounds? Again, just a quiet month, very brief update. Uh, I've been in and out of Birdsboro a number of times since school started, and I know there's very many happy children and staff in that building now that it's, it's cool, even though it has started to cool down weather-wise. 
um, September and October can always warm up. Um, there's really nothing, um, they're actually working very well. There was a little snafu, but just some minor adjustments needed. Uh, the system is going very well uh, with the new chillers that were installed this summer. Um, it's actually been, it was a little too cold a couple days, so they had to readjust it. But uh, in general, um, the chillers are, are working out very well, and the rest of the facilities across the district have uh, been um, handled very well. So there's really not much to report this month. Um, we are having planning to have Mr. Potts a meeting on October 1st, and we will have some pretty full agenda for October 1st. A lot of catching up. Hopefully uh, Mr. Smith will be with us. Hopefully uh, our prayers. Yes, he's, things are taking a turn for the better right now in his situation. Were there any unexpected costs or things that came up during the, the install of the chillers? That we need Not that I was made aware of. Uh, we can certainly double back on that at the facilities committee, but I haven't heard of anything negative. I mean, it was on time. Uh, as soon as they fired them up, they worked. I know Mr. Smith was very hands-on with it, spent a lot of time with train um, and, and got it up and running. So, um, Actually, they completed that, I think, believe, two weeks earlier than projected. Good. Uh, Mr. Smith did stay on top of that. Did train take the old chillers? I think that was part of the, was part of the, the net net for the price. We got a project. credit for the old chillers. So they should have done something else. Right. Those are all the questions I have. Any board members have any other comments or questions on facilities? Okay. Any questions or comments from the public? All right. Um, seeing on, we can move on to the next subject here. Finance. We will have any course approvals for the voting meeting. At this point, we don't have any to post. Um, item B is um, information was provided to the board members, uh, to all of you, um, for our participation in the settlement agreement, um, which I'm not going to read verbatim what it says there, but just talk to the point. Uh, as a result of a class action suit that was brought by Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Attorney General, and 23 other states, our district is eligible to receive the amount. For those of you that don't happen to have an agenda in your hand, it's not a lengthy amount or a, a a hefty amount, but it still is to the good, $4,293.99 uh, that we would be uh, allowed to receive um, under as part of the settlement. However, in order to, to do it, you actually have to have a formal board approval to accept it. And the reason for that is, is that you actually could go out on your own, but it would be litigation-wise way beyond your expense to even pursue this on your own. So being as part of the class action suit, uh, is to our benefit to get this money. Uh, Brian Supers has reviewed the matter, and he would obviously be here before you'd vote for questions if you should have any on the 24th. Uh, but we have provided you uh, with some uh, attachments from the PA Attorney General's office that provide further guidance on the issue. Uh, some of it's, frankly, a little bit more sophisticated than, than I quite even understand, but at the end of the day, uh, there's about $4,300 that's going to come to us as part of this. I was just kind of curious, did, did he or anyone in his office actually review the funding formula that they used, that they described in that? That's a question I can follow up with him and ask him. I don't know if he shared that with you, Danielle. I'm just reviewing his email. Uh, I don't think so. I was just curious. Specify. Yeah, I was curious to see if, you know, if anyone on our end has reviewed the funding formula to make sure that what we're getting is what we're supposed to be getting. As far as um, what we're getting, that was the settlement that was decreed through this class action suit. Again, we could go out on our own to try no, to... No, no, I'm not suggesting that. I'm saying that as part of the decision, they provided a funding formula as to how uh -huh. each school got their allocation of money. And um, I was just wondering if somebody in Fox Rothschild's I office follow up. had sure. actually worked it backwards. That I don't know. Take the fund, take how much money they're giving us, work it through the formula and see you what mean the, the math variables is are. Yeah, if the math is correct and whether we're, what we're getting is what we're entitled to get. If you can note that in the minutes, we'll follow up with Mr. Supers and, and see if that occurs. I don't know how complicated that is or if it's going to take a lot of hours or whatever the case may be. I'm just asking the question. So, Yeah, we can follow up. Okay. Um, That's it under finance at this yeah, point. Um, in terms of the... Dr. Go ahead. touch on the uh, letter that he asked you State bill and, uh, bill the yeah, just as in, uh, I had been, interestingly enough, as I tried to find resolutions, they're just not out there. So if we're going to proceed to support 
Mr. Shaheen, you can help me with the numbers. House Bill HB 1776 and 1400. Um, Mr. Subers actually sent me an email that said we might want to um, take a little bit more of a look at it in terms of what we would actually be endorsing before we do that. Uh, he sent me, um, for better or worse, I mean, PSBA put out a white paper on it and cautioned against uh, while it may look good in some places, it may be detrimental in other places. So um, I have a copy of that analysis. I'll be happy to send it to the board. At this point, we still have two weeks if we still want to go ahead. And uh, because that was your direction to me, um, if you hey, still want to go. Just so it's not a mystery, I mean, I've read the paper also, and it talks about the fact that sales tax and use tax taxes are are not a sure thing year in and year out, they, they, they vary greatly. Therefore, they're recommending that if they go that way, that a certain portion of the school district budget still be a property tax um, to make up the gap. Um, and then I've heard the other end of the argument, well, sure, if you want to go ahead and do that, what is the assurance that 100% of the money that comes from that sales tax and 100% of the money that comes from the use tax actually is applied to education? Because if everybody would call, sales tax was initially enacted to take care of education, and as was gambling revenue. And uh, as soon as they found out what the pool money it was, it all got put everywhere else. Uh, so unless language is put into that bill. My understanding is that language is in the bill to make sure that money that's raised is. 100% of that money has to go toward education. That's correct. Uh, and that any shortfall from the prior year needs to be made up some way other than property tax, then the uh, PSBA is, is, is recommending that property tax still be a, a, a viable option for a shortfall. But I guess, you know, people that are dug in the numbers far further than we have uh, at the state level and the local level seem to claim that, that sales tax is far far and above enough to take care of uh, school taxes and then still have a considerable amount of money. I mean, I'm in support of it. Uh, I know the rest of the board voted in favor of it <clears throat> two weeks ago, and I wasn't here, but I, I fully support the initiative. So um, whatever clarification you guys sure. want to provide in the ensuing two weeks, that's great. Absolutely. Other states have done it, so yeah. um, In terms of a finance committee meeting, I will be – I was hoping the other members of the committee would be here. We'd, we'd set up a meeting. Um, I will reach out to them. My apologies for not getting one in late August. Um, I was on vacation. So um, we will schedule it for the next, sometime in the next two weeks here. Uh, as far as committee meetings, where are we going to be holding them? We still have the uh, Matthew Brook basement room. Okay. So until there, there's, um, there was a thought that once this bridge project gets started, which I'm going to be talking about a little bit later, we may want to lose that cost and give that to them, and then we'll just have to find spots around the district. We have plenty of space. Yeah. So we'll just relocate somewhere and just make sure the public's notified as to where we would be. As I think, you know, facilities, they rotate their meetings between buildings. Correct. Um, right now, I mean... It would be, well, obviously, we get rid of, out of that lease, would be netting 20000 Actually, the library here is a good setting for committee well, I mean, meetings. That's fine. I just want to make sure that... that Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Any um, any other comments or questions by board members? Okay, seeing none. Any comments or questions by members of the public on finance? At two. Sorry, say that last part again. I couldn't hear the last part. Yeah, we reopened the budget. That's correct. Um, I believe one hundred fifty-four thousand dollars went into revenues from an accountability block grant, 
and subsequently on the expense side, it was spent out in, where was it, uh, Danielle, in? Uh, Emory in, uh, is it student? Uh, Title I. Things. No, Title I still Title not going to talk about that. Uh, like after school? Just that, was the largest, that, was development, that was the largest. That was development, professional development activities. That was the largest single ticket item that impacted our budget. Thank you, Yeah. My recollection is we received level funding from 1213 to 1112. So, and we actually got a little bit more. Is that correct from the state? No, but I'm talking about 1112. So you're talking about if you're talking about 1011 versus 1112, I believe we went back to. Um, I'd have to pull up. I'd have to pull up the budget. The differential was. Hold on. I probably have stimulus spending. The state gave us as much as they did. State coffers, but the stimulus money that was used to Daniel Cricket, there was stimulus money, money that, that the federal government gave us. So they gave us a bunch of money, which it had a significant increase over the prior year. And then when they took it away the next year, they said, well, We gave you the same amount as previously, just the federal stimulus money wasn't there. And that was where our shortfall came. So yeah, they funded us at a level, but it was a, without the stimulus money that we were not aware was there. So they, they, they the, state, the state money, when you say stimulus money, that was from the federal government but through the state government to come to you. That's correct. That's correct. That you did not get, that was not reinstated. That's, yeah, stimulus money was one, one time shot. So I don't know if he's, he didn't mention stimulus later, but he did say, but again, I believe we were not made aware as a board or as a district that part of that pool of money we got that year included a one-time stimulus bond. Um, yeah, we were. My recollection was we, we okay. knew, and I'm trying to think of the number off the top of my head. Wasn't it almost like a million dollars? Like $968,000 seems to stick in my head, uh, which was part of the stimulus of that particular year, in addition to the seven or eight million, seven point eight million or whatever that we get from the state. So um, it was a shot in the arm for the school district and allowed our budget to jump from one year to the next. Um, so in fact, you may have gotten the same amount minus the stimulus money. So if he would have added that comment to it, then that would be correct. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Richard
I believe it still uses the same funding formula that was developed with um, Act One. Right. So. Yeah. They're, they're using that. Yep, thank you. That's great news. Thank you so much. Let me just say thank you. Who should do they contact? Just start with me tomorrow. I'm easy to find when there's an offer like that. <laughs> Any other public comment on your finance? I want to follow that up. Okay. Thank you, guys. That's amazing. Thank you very much. I'm shocked. Uh, moving on to number nine, personnel. Um, under items A and B, as listed, nothing really to elaborate. Under item C, again, not to have to go through all of these, but for everybody's benefit, all of these appointments under C are replacements or new hires for currently existing positions. Okay, under, uh, so, so when, when you do not list a replacement in parentheses, that is correct. Yes, just again, for the public's benefit, if there would be anything new, we would certainly list it as a new position and talk about funding source, but these are all contractual issues and positions that are already um, in our budget and uh, accounted for contractually with positions and job descriptions. Um, I'm sorry, again, Mr. Sheen's question. So if they are on here with no replacements, they would the same person last year, correct? That is, that's what, that's why I took away from the state, yes. Yeah, so, so uh, C2B would have been the same person that had that position last year from what I'm looking at. I don't know that's what I'm, I'm saying. Correct? Um, I don't, I can check into that. I, that may not be the case. Um, the reason... Again, again, even though it's a shared position, if it's a new person, we'd like to kind of have an idea who had that position last year. Yeah, we can, we can find out who that's replacement. I think that's a replacement. We'll have to find out who that was. Because there's two of them. It's also a date. Right. I know that Connie Taylor took that as a nine cents. Right. What was that? I'm sorry, what was that? I said... Uh, He's two... Two, two uh, C, uh, B, two and D. B and B. Say, let's say, shared okay. position. Okay. So, the way it's written, we have to think that person had the position last year. Okay. If it doesn't... Okay, that's that's right. replacement and not a new position that was not last year. Okay. That, well, I'm sorry, that wasn't my question, but thank you. Okay. That was my question. My, my question is that we abided by the teacher's code. How would we not be abiding by the teacher's contract? Yeah, I'm not sure about that question. By replacing. So these people are no longer teachers. Again, uh, you don't need to be a teacher. Non-teacher and have a a. Uh, Can you? Okay. Yeah. I'm just, that, that was my question. The fund, the fee that that person gets charged is contractual. Is governed by the contract. Okay, but but. So Connie Taylor, who is not a teacher anymore because she retired, okay, that's can hold that I, position. That's why I'm back to the original question. But was that she can hold that position, but she has to be charged with the contract service. Okay. Again, that's why I asked the question. I, in fact, the reason I'm asking well, you is to answer the first one, when you said it was the same as last year. We'll check into those. If there's their names, sure we'll add them to the voting agenda. Three are substitute staff, and four are building volunteers. As we process them, uh, they come to you for approval. And the volunteers log on through our... They Raptor. go through our Raptor system. Mrs. Barr and 
everybody in the office get rather busy at times with, with people coming in. We're providing IDs. Yes. Okay, any other comments from That's board it. members? For personnel. Any comment or questions from members of the public on that item? Okay, moving on to programs. Under item A, you have your monthly enrollment. And I do want to pause here just to give a little bit of an analysis. As you can see from the attachment that you were provided, our official third day enrollment, which is what PDE asks us to, co to collect, is down by 106 students. So that is beginning uh, to have some impact. However, if you analyze that a little more closely, 80 of those students come from APC and AIC, so it's the Amity Elementary Campus, with the largest decrease in those two areas occurring in our kindergarten enrollment at APC, which is down 39 students from last year, um, probably no doubt impacted by the fact that we are uh, into our second year of a half-day kindergarten. The, because if you look at the other elementary kindergarten enrollments are actually fairly stable and up a little bit with an increase of 17 at, at BEC and a slight decrease of 6 at MEC. So I'm at, I'm at a loss to explain why that is that way. But overall, it, it comes out to what I just shared with you. Dr. Adelie, in kindergarten, you can see if they're down the rate that you stay, did you do any adjustment on, on staff at that point? At this point, no. Um, we haven't. Um, I mean, we, we, I think, I mean, again, if, if we, we geared our staffing based upon X number of It's a whole class. It's a whole class. Or well, and a half. Or half. Or a almost two. It's a session. Yeah. I'll have to check into that. And I'm just asking the question for somebody else does. No, I'll, I'll, I'll have an answer for you um, as soon as I can go back and look at that. Some do, the, some don't. The numbers actually went down a little bit for that this year as well. I, mean, I remember Mrs. Trainer, she would go out and contact some of these organizations to find out what the, I think, you know, how many kids are going to come back in the district and continue to do that. Yes. Mr. Wolf, I actually think with, with ABC, uh, we're seeing the result of a lack of who owns the building. No, that reimbursement comes in. Once you turn in your enrollment figures and you get reimbursement for that, so we didn't really technically lose anything. It, okay. it just would be less than a prior year. It's not a loss per se. It's just money that you don't, you can't get reimbursed for somebody that's not in a chair. So it's not a loss per se. It's just the, the formula so for... Lost right. Prior right. So, you know, prior year level, that's, that's $43,000. It's a $10,000 loss. Right. No, what well, you're there's ten thousand dollars roughly what it costs to educate the student. Right, but what do we get? What do we get? I thought the funding formula was around ten thousand dollars and it was costing us closer to thirteen or something that Daniel Boone. Well again, whatever it is, I mean there there we, we budget a specific amount and with the enrollment being down we short that specific whatever that, that amount. Well we ought to be taking a look at the classroom sizes yes. and where these kids are and are are the um, I didn't see it in there, but they didn't have the classroom um, breakdown. No, they're not. That's so not you didn't know. I mean, are these now the teachers teaching classes of seven, or are they teaching classes of you know twenty-one? You know, and if that's the case, can you lose can you lose um, a session or two? Well, the hundred and six overall. You can't run it that way. You're down three or two there or one there. You can't lose 
This is just a general enrollment report. The next report, we can probably do it at curriculum and instruction as part of looking at the class sizes and how many students each teacher has and the, and the staff coverage. That would be a good place for this. This is just the general across the entire district enrollment. Right. Do you think you can get us that report? Because I remember last year, well, in prior years, we get a report actually broken down by class. So it would say special needs kids, you know, versus... Uh, right, we would always do that as part of the budget process, but we can actually bring that with out. Our monthly re with our monthly reports, we'd have a number of kids in each class, so there'd be like, I don't know, APC first grade, and it'd be like 19, and then it was like 21, 23, 27, 20, okay. whatever it was. Yeah, that's, different sizes. That's, in the, this is, that's in the monthly enrollment. I'm using these figures from the Thursday enrollment. Right. We, we do that every month, so we'll yeah. have one next month. Okay. Well, look, we have that by the... Uh, I can have can it you take the third day enrollment and just crank those out and have it to us for the next meeting? Sure, absolutely. Just, just, to, I mean, just so you're aware, I mean, just because we're down 106 heads, we are going to lose that revenue, but at the same time, that doesn't equate to, and I, and I know we all hope that the state doesn't equate to flat headcount. You know, unless it's you're talking about one building. Staffing. Yeah. Yeah, I, so, you lose one kid, one grade, you can't, you can't double the class up. So. Well, I'm just looking at future budgets. How is that decrease going to affect our future budget when we budget for the students? What, we budget what it will do is when we go to calculate how many staff we need versus the projected number of students and we do the division problem, it will probably reduce the number of staff that we need if the projections hold up. Okay. Any other questions about the enrollment? Okay, you want to move on? With sure. The Items B and C are just, they will, those are trips, um, as you can see from those two different groups. Again, anytime there's an overnight trip, whether it's paid or not, uh, by the district, in this case these aren't, uh, it requires board approval, so those are um, well in advance of the dates, but they need to get planning for those. So those are all, um, those are two items that will need board approval. Okay. And item D is this is just the actual amount of the money for the information shared back in the spring with the Title I and Title II grants. Um, actually, in this, um, and Mrs. Penza can help me with this after I introduce this, we received about $100,000 more than we were anticipating here uh, for this grant, but this is all money that has to cover um, federal programs and things that fall under Title I and Title II. In, in essence, uh, general speaking, um, this grant covers parts of salaries for our reading specialists at MEC and BEC, staff development for teachers who work with Title I students, supplies that go toward Title I students, and professional development activities for students, again, that are covered by, this is really to help students that are struggling in different areas, and they're covered by Title I and Title II grants, so this is all pure federal money. Let me ask a question. Is this, is this revenue neutral money, i.e., we get more, we have to spend more? Correct. Or? It all has to be expensed out. It's revenue in, and, or revenue in and then expensed out. It has to cover things that are, it's pretty much similar to the ABG, but it's kind of the federal level. Would that be correct? That's fair. But Mrs. Penza and I had a conversation about this today, and she said the business managers, I guess, across the county kind of were a little bit shocked by the fact that it came in a little higher than usually the federal money that doesn't happen. You need this one? Here. I mean, just the, that's, the, that's the true statement. There was emails that were sent around, and uh, because of such the, the large swing, a lot of the business managers <laughs> were entering that revenue into their budgets. Yeah, and then, with the revenue going in and the expense going in, it's really, it really doesn't have an impact. So if we didn't get the money, it wasn't going to harm us. Right. If we do, then we can spend it. Let's be real careful because it's called a correct um, wasn't there a time in the last couple of years that they gave us a number and then came back and corrected it? Uh, we got a number we got, this was probably prior to your tenure, Mrs. Spence, but we got a number that Mr. Gruchek reported and then came back two or three weeks later and reported a different number because there was some type of mathematical error. No, I do remember that. Yeah. So, yeah, so you remember that. I mean, so I just feel, when you get the surprises like that, I tend to be a little concerned that, you know, it may not be correct, so. 
Start that's spending it in January. To Dr. Otto and Mrs. Mm -hmm. Trainer, when we were doing all this, you know, she said until you get that official approved application. Yeah. 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 Don't you know, spend it. So. so at this point, it's as as official as we can represent. So um, we'll be putting that on the agenda. You actually have to vote that. Right. Any other comments or questions from board members? I have one more. I have a note here, Dr. Otto, at some time. Absolutely. Um, Mr. Hawes um, and I have met. Uh, we had a meeting with representatives from Berks Online and the BCIU. Um, our, we have a, a, I'll call it a mini team for lack of a better uh, term that's actually taking a look at um, trying to think out of the box of how we might entice some cyber students back to our, um, our school. Um, we're in the very beginning stages of that. You're certainly invited to the Revenue Enhancement Committee meeting next week because we're actually going to be talking about that. Um, Mrs. Uh, Hamill has put that on her agenda, given us time. Um, I will be out of district next week, but Mr. Hawes will be filling in for me next week at that meeting. Um, so we do have some, some options. Um, I'm cautiously optimistic at this point that we might be able to do something. Um, the visionary side of me is looking out there to think that this is the way education is going, so we might as well get out in front of it as much as we can. Um, many districts are already starting to foray into um, cyber school options, so we don't want to be behind the curve on that. Well, Fleetwood, uh, I don't know a lot about their program. I just know they're, Mr. Hawes, you can correct me. I, I don't think they're using the IU. They're kind of going out on their own. So is that an option for us? I mean, instead of there, there are going to be many options once we uh, get I mean, through taking a look at this. Brandywine's piggyback and run that. We can just get this in place for next year. I believe Boyer County is set up. Well, see that the one thing that you want to be careful of is um, not creating a new expense, and we know with the approximately using last year's numbers, there are about. 80 students, predominantly at the middle school, high school level, who are accessing the cyber school option. We don't know whether they were, some of them may have been, I haven't analyzed the numbers closely enough, some of them may have been former homeschooled students, so we weren't getting reimbursement for them in the first place. Some of them aren't, and each one of those students it follows a, a sizable amount of our uh, subsidy follows them out the door when they go off to cyber school. Uh, our feeling is, is that we have a pot of money to work with, and if we can reinvent ourselves within that pot of money and not incur new expense, even if we come out as a wash, it will be another option for kids that we can do in-house that I think will be a good thing in the long run for the school district and for the kids. So um, that's all at the conceptual stage right now, but we are beginning to uh, delve into it, and you'll hear more next week at the Revenue Enhancement Committee meeting with, with where we are specifically and um, we're thinking about uh, potentially piloting something with uh, maybe all ed students at this point. So we've given it a lot of thought. We just want to be tread very carefully that, because there is potential to create a new expense in this program if a lot of people would decide that they actually would want to do this. So we have to be very careful that uh, we, we find that balance and um, we're prepared to do that. I'm just thinking out loud here that <clears throat> Obviously, there's got to be some sort of benefit for piggybacking with another school district. They already have the program established. So um, if your students were to go to there, there's got to be some sort of reimbursement from that school district for your students. There's got to be some sort of inter-district uh, agreement that's established that allows um, us, in this particular case, or Fleetwood or whoever, to recoup some of those funds that Brandywine otherwise receives. Otherwise, what would the incentive be to do it? Um, mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm just throwing that out there as a, a way to get our toe in the water and establish something quickly. That may be an option to look at 
um, for next year or however quickly that can be done well, until is, we have our better understanding as to what it is we're doing, and then we can incorporate something in our own. I don't think anyone disagrees with the approach you guys are taking. Right. Um, no, your, your toe in the water analogy is very good. I saw a quote recently from Warren Buffett, don't test the river with both feet. So we're trying to test the river with that toe in the water. I mean, and the concept, I mean, I know one of the students are doing this personally, and the concept is of being in webinars and, and uh, video conference teaching and, and all your testing online. It's with you. At the end of the day, in, 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 in the way I see education going, it's... It's going to be very good for a certain segment of our students, and I, I think of this gifted students where you can't really supplement the way you would like. This opens up a whole new world to them. Um, students who um, might want certain electives with, who knows where our budget's going to go, but what electives we might not be able to offer to everyone anymore. So that it might be a, a realm for that. There are, um, with space constraints, et cetera, et cetera, there are many uh, positive aspects to it. It's, it's just, again, I'm, my major concern, and I hate to say it because I always like to put program before money, but we need to watch the money on this one so it doesn't become a cost that we can't bear first. So uh, we want to make sure that the pot of money that we have can support what it is we want to do, and we're hopeful that um, we can do that sooner than later. So we've... Uh, Mr. Hawes has brought some good ideas with his experience at the IU. Mr. Hankel's been part of the conversation. Mrs. Torsh has been part of the conversation. So uh, the IU has given us some food for thought. And um, I think we're on the brink of, of getting something started. I, again, I just want to make sure that the, the program in this case um, follows the money that we have to support it. Any other questions from board members, comments? Mr. Hawes, do you want to add anything to what we talked about, Mr. Hankel? I guess I over-talked it. <laughs> Any but, questions uh, or comments from members of the public? Okay. Anything else uh, under here? Okay. No, that wasn't on, actually was not on yep. the agenda, but thank you, Mr. Shaheen, for bringing that up. Policy? Um, second readings are all being reviewed by um, Mr. Subers. I did want to point out there was some question about item G, uh, again, we are working with um, on a set of guidelines and practices once it's implemented that will make, there was a concern about this policy being user friendly. Um, already uh, in anticipation of this, uh, Ms. Ms. Goss has indicated to me that coaches are already starting to implement parts of this policy even though it has not been formally approved and that they're starting to make use of Daniel Boone email to, to reach out to parents to start this process. It'll come with some fits and starts, but I'm confident that we'll get it to where it needs to be to protect the safety of our kids, which is my, my primary concern. Other than that, um, I do have an item for discussion. I would like to throw this out for some board discussion. Let me introduce it. As you remember last year, again, I, I, I need to talk money here, uh, but this is also a, a planning issue. Uh, I'd like to recommend that... Um, we go ahead and develop a policy and a set of guidelines, not here tonight, obviously, but that help us manage how we address postseason competitions. Um, currently, we actually have no set policy and have not been following any set practice on this issue. As you saw, we frankly kind of scurried last year to make sure we found money for TSA, make sure we found money for Odyssey, and luckily there was some money left over here and there to do that. I don't like to operate that way, so my main concern is with what happens with competitions. We don't seem to have too much trouble when they're local and at the state level. It's when they get beyond us. So as of right, uh, beyond the state level. So as of right now, we really don't budget for them. And when we're confronted with a request, we really don't have a consistent response. So I'd like to bring this matter to the policy review committee, as I think we need some specific guidelines on how to handle the issue to avoid future problems, because I'm getting requests already for what might happen in the spring, and I don't, I don't want to go through that again. So I, I think we need to put some uh, policies in place and guidelines, so if you have some thoughts on that, I can certainly take them back to the policy review committee and begin to work them into the policy that I think we need. I think a good way to start on that would be to go back, look backwards over the last five to ten years and see how much, what events, uh, maybe ten years is too far, 
but maybe f last five years, see what events um, kids have been participating in, uh, both athletically and through the clubs or whatever, and determine what those costs are and see if there's an average amount of money that we tend to be spending every year on these things and maybe that becomes a line item in a budget. Or if it varies in one year there's none and in other years there's a lot, maybe we just have a fund that's set aside as like an escrow account and we fund it and that's the money that's available for those types of events and you know you draw that down and then maybe you don't draw it down for a year or two or maybe you draw it down in, in six months. I don't know what it is. That's probably the way but, State level isn't an issue as much as when they go to that, they go to the worlds, and they go to the United National State level worlds. Two, two groups in 10 years made it that level, which was the Iowa level where they, they wanted help. Um, so an escrow fund, as you, as you stated, uh, would not be hit all that hard. Well, I'm just thinking an escrow fund because you, you only have to fund it once. Right. And then you, you you, it in, in it's there, it's drawn down, and, and then when you get to a certain I don't know, minimum threshold, it comes up on the board agenda as a, hey, do we, we put this in the, in the budget to fund it for next year to build it up? It's something that people, groups can donate to to make sure there's, there's funds of balance and, available. And that's, that's the big ticket one because when TSA goes to uh, Seven Springs it is for the, the, the state competition, um, it, it's, you know, it's a hotel, it's a, it's a couple of Yeah, whatever we do, I just want to make sure we have something it's not, that... It's not, it's not as expensive as plane flights to Iowa. Let's put it that it's, way. More, it's more for the expectation of the kids that are involved so that they know that at the end of this, that I hate to leave people on and then, oops, you know, you did so good, but now you, now you can't finish your mission. And I, I don't think that's a good thing to do. At the same time, I don't think we're in a financial position to pay 10 plane flights to Los Angeles, California, if something might happen to be in L.A. So that's, I want to try to find that balance there. And I, I mean, I thought we came up with a good plan last year, but the process side of me was not comfortable how that all unfurled. And I think we need to get a process in place and a system that at least lets everyone know what the expectation is. And when I'm not here and all of us around here aren't here anymore, we still have a process in place that will help uh, future generations decide what it is they had to do. But because I think we came up with a good plan last year. We just got lucky in, in some respects that there was some money there and we were able to, you know, set, we would, you know, we had a reimbursement formula and we kind of did it together and everybody got reimbursed for everything and everybody went away happy. But it's not written down anywhere and that doesn't make me comfortable. The other thing about the policy of the state, <clears throat> you or somebody's have final approval. In other words, you can't be invited. They might be, an organization might be invited some, but they don't necessarily have to go. Absolutely. In other words, it's not open-ended that, Oh, our season ended, but let's just continue for the sake of continuing. Right. There has to be a reason or a mission or, you know, a goal to keep right. going, not just continue the season. So, so we're meeting in the policy committee in October, early October. We'll bring some ideas there and begin to formulate something and put it on paper. And this would include all extracurricular activities? Mm -hmm. Sports, band, Well, sports clubs. You generally don't have an issue because PIAA stops at the state level and then you're done. So we're already covered there. Um, my, the policy, I, I think we should address what happens at the state level. I don't think that's as much of an issue, but we really do need, even if we, it is, we could have conceivably, if you have a good group of students that are really, you know, knocking it out of the park with TSA year in and year out, we could be dealing with this four, five, six, seven years in a row here. Well, you're still, you're still sending 10, 15 kids every year. Absolutely. At the state level, at TSA. I mean, year in and year out, they're going, you're sending 10, 15, I've already been approached. The, 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 the talk, that's why I brought this forward. I thought, no, wait a minute. We're, we're going to get out in front of this this year rather than behind it. I see a mind's a different story. It's a different, completely different thing. Two in ten years. But TSA, it's every single year you're going to send. You know you're going to send a number of kids. Have we also, um, just throwing it out there now while we have more board members here than to just sit on the policy committee, um, are we going to discuss what types of things you're going to fund? So we Absolutely. fund... Absolutely. Hotels, but not right. meals. Fun, right. This, but not That's exactly that. what we you did know, last year. Bus tickets, but not plane right. tickets. That's what we know. did last year. We talked about stipends and capping it, number of days, days of competition versus days of travel. We can put all that in that language, what I, what I call the micromanaging language, into the guidelines. But we just got to get a, 
I, I think where we need to get is first philosophically, do we want to support these kinds of things? And I think the answer to that is yes. We want to do it though if we have the resources to back it up. So that's the second philosophical piece. Then once the philosophical piece is in place, we can put the, the procedures in place fairly easily. It's just that they're not written down anywhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to use Mr. Shaheen's, it's on the back of a napkin somewhere. I don't think that's a good way to operate. I think it's an excellent idea. I appreciate you bringing it to our attention, and I agree with you. You know, Addressing it when the moment hits is the wrong way to do it. Planning for it ahead of time is the right way to do it, and I think that's, that's an obligation we have to the kids of the school district. So when they are performing, they know that there's there's an opportunity to move on, and, and um, their season, quote-unquote, isn't cut short just because um, we didn't plan properly. So, so we'll, I'll do some research for another district. To be honest with you, I've already done a little screening of other school districts' uh, policies on their websites, and I have found very little. So I have a feeling a lot of districts are kind of, you know, here and there. Maybe their foundations are committing to these things. Our foundation is not up and running yet. In the future, our foundation may be able to help contribute to things like this. I'd recommend you, you check uh, Big Spring, because um, uh, I know Odyssey, they tend to send a lot of people. Okay. And Warrior Town from GSA, because they tend to rank in the top first or second place almost every time I've gone to see those. And, and they don't have a policy, maybe uh, pick up the phone and call the superintendent and ask how they handle that. I just remember from my days back at Twin Valley, they used to have a very strong, I think it was actually it was their technology student team. And as principal, I went through the same thing. They'd come to me, can I have this? I'd go, well, I don't have the money. You know, and then I'd have to go to the board, and the board would go, well, why didn't you budget? Well, we didn't, you know, so we got to get past all that and, and make sure we're, we're having a, a plan rather than a reaction. Okay. Any other board members' comments or questions? In this section? Okay, seeing none, any comments from the public on this policy? She left for a number of years to go to Kutztown. I don't know exactly how many years that was. Prior to the administration, she was a history teacher here, a building principal, and then she had functioned in a various assistant to the superintendent kind of positions the rest of her time here.
No, I think we, this is all extracurricular activities. So that would include athletics, music, clubs, everything. Right. 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 Actually, I don't think it really is in the budget. I mean, we have a budget, and uh, my recollection was we did an analysis, uh, let's say it wasn't this past year, but the year before, where the, I, think, I believe Mr. Schott asked the question, which was how much money do we actually spend on postseason play in all sports? And I think the number was just around $20,000. I have it written down somewhere. I didn't bring that particular folder with me, but... Um, and that extra money just came out of the, the general fund balance. So we weren't budgeting for that because one year to the next you didn't know who was going and who wasn't going to postseason play. But it didn't change much. Right, overall, and that, that was the number we were given. So um, I think what Dr. Otto is suggesting here is, you know, extracurricular postseason funding policy, period. That, that includes athletics. And that's why I was suggesting, hey, look, let's take a look over the last five years. What teams are going? What's it costing us to send these kids uh, to these things? And we can do an analysis on an annual basis, how, how much money are we spending and how much money do we need to set aside and put it in, the, in an escrow account. So as you suggest, if football doesn't go to postseason play, well, then they're not dipping into the escrow account. Volleyball might be, right? Or TSA or Odyssey of the Mind or whoever it is that goes on to the next level of whatever it is they're doing. It doesn't stay in, in some cloistered part of the budget for a specific sport. We just don't budget our sports that way. They, they, they're using individual. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Finish. They're ballparking what they think their expenses are. So they're going to maybe over on one, they may be under on another, but net, net, you know, it, it's, it's where they think they need to be total budget wise. I understand your concern, and Dr. Idle's going to handle that, saying, okay, all sports, all activities, TSA, marching band, whatever, competitions, and above and beyond a normal season, is going to have a policy set. The one thing that I would just add to the conversation that's unique about sports is unlike the activities that we're at least talking about, TSA and Odyssey of the Mind, they're not revenue generators. Football, five home football games every year generates quite a bit of revenue for the school district. Um, eight to ten or twelve home basketball games generates considerable revenue because people don't get into those for free. So all of that money gets thrown into the mix of what we're talking about, as well as what we budget beyond that. I don't, Mr. Spencer, maybe you can elaborate on how you budget the revenues. I guess we take the previous season's gate and, and kind of use a prediction model and, and figure out what we would have. But when we have a big crowd come here from Pottsville, or like with the Springford game last year, there's quite a bit of money coming into the school district uh, at each one of those home football games. They, they probably generate more revenue than any other sport, frankly. Uh, so that's help, that helps offset those costs as well. Um, it's the same model that we have for our plays when we sell out three straight nights, and we use that money to help defray the costs for that. So what's a little bit different, and I will factor it in as we talk about this policy, certain activities generate revenue and others are gener gener uh, revenue neutral. They don't generate anything. They're, they're a flat cost. They're a sunk cost, period. It's not the case with all of our sports programs, especially the ones that generate a significant amount of crowd. But please, Dr. I want to understand that the football store goes to 80,000 and generate 30,000 ticket sales. Shane, I'm not going to debate that with you. We generate revenue from those sports, Shane. We don't generate revenue from other things. I mean, you have to change your mindset. But look, the, the way the the way that I mean, we're not going to get an argument about this tonight. No, no, I, I just want you to understand the way we football doesn't have a budget per se, and then they're not being held to adhere to a specific budget. Neither does volleyball or any of these places. Our budget is sort of built up as to what are the costs of the different programs that we offer, and a lot of those are in 
Um, some of them are in equipment. Some of them are in salaries and stipends to the coaching staff. And I mean, that's the bulk of it, to be quite honest with you. And at the end of the day, we assemble all those costs and we come up with an overall budget for athletics, right? Now, you could break it down by sport or by uh, um, school, middle school, high school. Um, but at the end, that's not how we've treated it. We've treated it as one athletic budget of $647,000, whatever the number is. And we take a look at that budget and we take a look at what are the game receipts. And all the game receipts go to support all the sports. And what are the activity fees? And all the activity fees go to subsidize all the sports. And I think we came up with like 300 and some odd thousand total revenues between athletic fees and game receipts. Yeah, somewhere, I thought it was just shy of 300, that go towards the 647,000 overall budget. So the, the sports themselves and the students who, and families who participate in them are paying for almost a little less than half or, you know, 35, 40% of the overall cost of the program, and the district and the taxpayers are, are subsidizing the rest. Um, I think what Dr. Otto is proposing is, look, let's address this issue of postseason play, which typically just came out of fund balance as an extra cost. Now we're going to figure out some way to budget for that going forward. And whether it's an escrow fund or it's a line item budget every year, that way the money is available for all the teams to go to postseason play. And if they don't, the money is available for a different team to do that, which is exactly what you're asking us to do. So we're on the same page. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I think it's only fair we let Dr. Otto come back. I mean, this is preliminary at this point. So, I mean, we could sit here all night and discuss it. No, I think the issue was just sort of clarifying it. Well, well no, we've yeah. clarified this now for three years. Correct. This, this Correct. Well, let me just add one more clarification. One of the, from a philosophical standpoint, every one of these activities is now being subsidized in part by the family. Correct. I think we owe it to them to let them know at the end of the year if their kids have done so well, how we're going to help them. Correct. That's all I'm trying to say. You're exactly right. Okay. And look, it's okay to get some pushback every now and then. I, I don't mind pushback so, at all. Um, it fine. allows us to... <laughs> right. Okay, so all right. moving on. Any other comments from uh, members of the public? All right, seeing none. Uh, we'll move on to transportation. Actually, I do have a report this month. Usually, we don't have much to say, but um, board members, um, with the start of the new year, I'm going to give Mrs. Torsha some credit as well, uh, putting her stamp on the district early here. We have developed a primary student drop-off letter that we asked all parents to sign off on, again, just really for safety. Again, I, the more I'm finding out is the more you have to enforce safety the more it sometimes becomes inconvenience, but that's the way it has to be. Um, but the letter that we provided you was one that was sent home to all parents of K-2 students to make them aware that um, if there is not a responsible person at the bus drop-off, we'll, sometimes the bus drivers, frankly, they'll go around the block. They'll try to help and, and see what they can, but we are not going to drop off a child with no responsible adult there. And if that happens more than once or twice, we are going to start calling the local authorities because that's something, that's a parental responsibility. We, we cannot continue to hold children for hours on end at the end of the day. It's very minimal that it actually happens, if, if at all. I, don't, I think it's, it may have happened once or twice so far this year. But um, the reason that we put it in a, a letter form is that no one can say they weren't informed. So this is a, a bit of informed consent to say that they've signed off on this, they understand what they're going to do, and we are going to do everything that we can to ensure the safety of their children. Do you have a copy of that letter right here? It's in your... Um, I know, um, I know it's in the... Yes, uh, as a matter of fact, I didn't bring I it. Have it. So go. I just want to, for the benefit of the public and the press, there's a couple of points on here that maybe we just talk about. It just says, uh, in efforts to work with our transportation providers and to keep our children safe, the following procedures will be put into place when a K-1... K-1 and two grade level child is not met at the bus stop by a parent designated adult, sibling, or accompanied by an older peer on the same bus. Uh, children grades K through 2 will be returned to the school building in which they attend. Parents will be required to pick up their child up at the school by 4. If the child is brought back to school repeatedly uh, due to no one being at the bus stop, the district will have no other alternative other than to contact the local authorities. So that's the guideline. I have a question. Who's going to be there till 4 o'clock? Well, that was my next question. Yeah. Because this thing just came up years ago. Now I'm getting old again. 
Let's give up here to go that one is who's going to... Well, the children. principles are generally there until four. If, what, if they, what if they're not? And well, they're we'll, we'll have to work with that contingency. So what if the parent's still not there until five? They work until five. I, again, I, I'm not disagreeing with this letter, but... Mr. Basil, I think you were going to comment the same thing I did. This came up several years ago. It came up like two, three years. Torsha, do you want to, as an elementary principal, four, come on up here and help me with this? There, say the person's there to the, the, the parent. I'm going to tap her experience as a former elementary principal to help you with this. I mean, again, four o'clock's a great deadline. But if they don't come, what happens? Yeah, what are you going to do? Well, four o'clock is the time that our secretaries are meant to be in the building. Okay. That's, that's my concern. I know if, that even if you're still there, what if the parent says, "Well, I'm already late. I'm also finished with my work day. Stay till five 30. Actually, there have been. I believe in, in my four years here, there has been one instance where that happened, and they actually went back to the bus garage. That's not the environment. I agree. No offense that. to the bus garage, but we'd rather have them in a school than at the bus garage. I, agree. I also have a, a another concern. Again, it's, it's not the pointing fingers anything, but. I also don't want a student left in a building with a single individual either. I mean, that's true. One over one. Right. That's true. From that standpoint, too, for so that if you understand what I'm talking about, okay, uh, from your safety standpoint, from liability, that up to the extent. So if, if a student can't get picked up at the bus and you bring it back to the building and the secretary's go home, the other one in that building is the principal. I got more concern Correct. that you got a child alone in the building with somebody who's not. They're guarding it. Correct. I agree with that. Even if you make it 4 o'clock, obviously the parent can't make it up either still at work. Right. They're going to scramble and call cousin or aunt. Well, we hope they would. Well, let me put it this way. I don't want to create, this is probably a one or two or three time occurrence in a school year. I think what we're really doing is it's, it's a covering ourselves issue to make sure that people have been duly informed. Of, at least we have, again, it's written down somewhere. This is what we're going to do. There are always contingencies and always things that you can't predict for, and I, and I trust the adults that I work with that they're going to take care of the welfare of the child. We are not going to put a kid out on the street. Okay, so we, we, that's, that's not a question. That's that's not not question. question. I think the issue is more one of you know, what do we do with the child after 4 o'clock, and, and, and how do you handle that until whatever time whoever picks them up. Is it, it. And, and whoever's picking them up, is, are they on a list? Yeah. Is it just some random person? Um, do, maybe the best thing would be to take them to one location and all kids come back to that one location. Maybe it's the high school, maybe there's more activity going on in a given day. I don't know, or it's the middle school. We, we discussed that before, yeah. but then we have a transportation issue. Yeah. But we've discussed that before where they go back to, say, the high school auditorium and we actually have to babysit people to stay. Yeah, you got to babysit. But you know, Yeah. I'm not trying to cast aspersions at our parents in the community. 99.9% .9 of the time, this is not an issue. But we need to be prepared for the contingency when that happens. Sure. Oh, yeah, we agree with Very concerned on the subject, 
And obviously, all you need is one time at the beginning of the year. And we have a lot of training. Well, look, I, I think we support the idea. I think the question is to the degree you guys can create some sort of policy as to how you're going to handle things from 4 o'clock on so that other principals or administrators or whoever understand what their responsibilities are when a child's brought back to the school, then... And they are. They send out their own letters to the parents. This yeah. is just more or less supporting the bus company. I know that it's not just coming from our early levels, that it's a bit of a support that Well, no, we won't. Well, I was just saying okay. maybe just the saying, bus company yeah, that, takes them to... That opens up all issues with liability. And again, I know this is, these are the, the far exceptions to the rule. Uh, I guess... To make sure there's a policy in the district that is the same for And that that policy is adhered to, whether it's too deep supervision or, you know, where that child's going to go. If we, need, if we don't have the policy, then we probably should also defer that to the policy committee to put one in place on, uh, so that it's, that it's followed. And again, I, think I, I have the element of, has it happened at all this year yet? Yes. How many times? Once so far? Twice. See, Twice. That's fine. I mean, once in a while, it does happen. It's, if it's a continue with the same group of family members, then I got a concern. I, was, because because then you become being yeah, I remember that was the issue. And you become babysitters, and that's not fair to you, and it's also not fair to the district. Did you get a reason for the letter from the bus driver's point of view? Is that many parents aren't doing out there at home? Yeah. And they have this little kindergartner that they're dropping off at a nice little spot, and they don't see anyone oh. there. And okay, that makes sense. And they're not coming out. And, okay. and that would be a lot of huge concern. Um, okay, that makes sense. Especially where there's not other children coming off the bus. Correct. Um, that, that was really important. Correct. Really now look, we, we, I totally remember we discussed this at length two years ago, or whatever it was, three years ago, and, and I think we, we had the same questions then, which was, well, what happens when they get back to us? It, I guess that's where I was going, whether there was one particular building that worked best yeah, for dropping a kid off, where there's more active, there's more people there for a longer period of time. Back over. Say we designate the high school when they were, you know, they were dropped over here, the transportation had to drop them more left. Plus, I guess... Yeah, but if, school, why would the bus come back here when the bus just goes straight to the high school? Yeah, but what happens if the bus is handling the... Elementary kids. The elementary run out near... If they're in on ABC, uh, yeah, they're right. going to go right around the building that we just well, zone that's on the I, I guess my only thing would be there's enough sure. principals close by that if you're not in the building, or if the AIC principal's not here, the APC could cover them rather than, a, a, you know, at least a principal should cover them. Middle school principal could even go over to APC. You know, Birchmore and Monocacy could somewhat do it too. That would be my only concern is that the principal should stay there, not necessarily past 4 o'clock, I'm sorry. You know, up until 4 o'clock, I think that's fine. But I think the principal should probably do that. That's what the administration Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I think whatever the guideline is that you guys are establishing for yourself in house and what you're following, I mean, it addresses those concerns. Yeah. Okay. Okay, moving on um, under bridge closings, um, for any of you that have gone through downtown Birdsboro midday anymore, it's becoming like what I used to face when I traveled over to Lansdale and toward the Philadelphia area. So, with that intro, um, we were informed this morning. Um, well, first, let me go first with the bridge over Hay Creek. That closes tomorrow. Um, so the bus companies are aware of that. And we're, we have our contingencies in place. But the double dose is that we also received notification from PennDOT that the Route 345 bridge heading out of Birdsboro and that Exeter is going to be reduced to one lane as of Monday, September 24th. And that's going to last for three years until that project is done. So 
Um, given that we just found that out today, we're going to be reaching out to our transportation contractors to just kind of communicate it outside of this meeting to the rest of the community um, that bus rides may be affected. I already called Mr. Hankel today to let him begin announcements to the students that want to go over to Amity. You might want to head down to Monocacy and cut over Old Airport Road rather than going up 345. Um, it's going to be a little bit of a nightmare in, in old little old uh, Birdsboro for a couple years with oh, traffic. Of course, you want to have the one way traffic into Birdsboro, <laughs> out of Birdsboro. No, it's I, it, it, it's kind of we knew this was coming. I just um, Mrs. Bukowski in my office today walked in. We Danielle and I were having a conversation. She says, "Oh, by the way, I just got a call." Is it 24 hours a day? Well, once I mean, they yeah, start once working they on that down bridge, it's going down. They'll go one lane and work on it, just like they did. I remember when they did the the viaduct in Reading over. They had it was one lane for years, and then they'll close that down and they'll go over to the other side. Generally, the way they work on bridges. Where traffic go in or out. Well, no, I think what they'll do is they'll have a stoplight, and at both ends they'll have to install a temporary stoplight. Yes, yes, there's supposed to be a temporary bridge next to it, and then a new one where the old one I honestly don't have the details of that plan. I do know that uh, we went to a meeting last year, was it, or a year and a half ago maybe, where they're getting ready to close the bridge down in Douglasville too because that bridge is in terrible shape. So we're, we're looking at the potential of creating kind of an island community here with traffic. So that's beyond school, but we have to interface with the, the, the PennDOT doesn't really pay it. They did. And the house on the other side. They and then they went down the old one when the new one was built. So that's what so I they must have changed the All I know is that Monday is 424th, that bridge is going down to one lane. So stay tuned. We'll put some advertisements on the website. Probably make, wind up making some kind of connect ed call to those that might be affected by it. Um, well, everybody's going to be affected by it because you're going to delay school. You can't get kids at home. Um, we're hoping that that won't happen, so we'll, we'll work on a plan. Pick up times will change. Yeah. We'll start picking kids up earlier. I don't know what the transportation routes are going over that bridge, but um, I don't think we run too many buses over that bridge. So that's it for transportation. That's a, that's, that's a lot to contemplate. Okay, um, old business. I actually have two items. Uh, they're not on the agenda for the benefit of the public. The board has asked us, board members, you have at your at your places um, some extra handouts that I brought uh, regarding heat guidelines. Um, the, heat the, guide, heat. the heat guidelines were our, our national standards that our trainer is using that we've already started to implement. They're not in a formalized board policy, but how to handle uh, extreme situations of heat on our field. So. All the coaches have been made aware of that. Uh, the second thing is. I'm not going on that one there. I just have to note at 90 degrees air temperature and 40% relative humidity, which will never be in the summertime at 90%. Every 15 minutes, there's a mandatory break for water. That's I, I mean, again, we need to make sure that's happening because I guarantee it's probably not at this point. But moving forward next year, football, sure. arts and band, baseball in the spring. Yeah, we'll have it. We'll take a look at it. But that's what that's what we have right now. Yeah. And, um, the, and the only reason I brought that up is, you know, you go down to 86 degrees and 60 percent relative humidity, which is probably a realistic summer day. It's every 15 minutes. So. Well, it's a guideline right now. We can take it and tweak it and, and work with it. So, again, I mean, it's, it's, it's what needs to be done. Who, who, who issued this guideline? It doesn't say on here. Uh, that was uh, researched by... Um, I pulled this off. I also saw this exact chart online. The University of Tennessee, I think this is there. By Mr. Hartzell, our, our athletic um, trainer. Yeah, no, I was wondering. Obviously, he didn't create this himself. No, so no. Who... I was wondering what medical association or something came I'd up with to, this. I'd have to check into that. I, I saw this, this chart. On the you would think, I mean, if, if it's Tennessee's temperatures and humidity levels are going to be a lot different than Pennsylvania. Well, so they're, they're doing what they're saying. 
they're, they're, they're I think they're giving you some guidelines there. And what the temperature feels like. So it's a generic chart. It's upstate New York, or it could be in the deserts of California, that if it's 90 degrees and it's 40 percent humidity, it's going to feel like 91 degrees. And that's what the, that's and that's the heat index. So the heat index, the heat index, it's, it's, it does not matter where you are. It's, it's right. like wind chill. It's going to be, that's what it is. So whether it's Tennessee, Florida, upstate New York, Maine, it's the same. No, that should take into account all climates. Yeah. Because it takes humidity. If it's temperature, it's one thing, but it takes humidity right. into that. Into that. So I think it's a good start. Yeah. How are, they, how are they measuring relative humidity on the field? They got a barometer. He has he has some kind of uh, device that he uses and actually points it at the field and gives you all that data on, on the playing surface. It tells you the temperature and the relative humidity. I believe I'd have to to get further background on that, but um, they've become um, based on our our feedback to them to really take a look at that and check that. How often is that thing calibrated? That I don't know. I'd have to get that answer for you. Like any device, you don't want it, you know, if it's got an error rate of 15%, then <laughs> right. your, your guidelines here are pretty darn narrow. So, uh, okay, uh, what was the other one here? You have a concussion policy. On the uh, concussion policy, again, while we didn't have time to put it into a formalized written policy, we have implemented the practice that you see there uh, that directs coaches on what to do if there is a suspected concussion. This is one that I would like to put down in a formal board policy and bring back to the um, PRC in October when we have our meeting. One but, of the things that we don't have is what we, the number of concussions we would allow before we, we would have to not allow that happen to participate. We would probably want to get some medical advice written into the policy. I think we should, I think we should because. There are people that are, that are very susceptible to concussions. Oh, absolutely. And, and as we write around today, you play again next week, you get right. wrong again. Now you've got two very serious issues. Well, I think it goes hand in hand as far as when you're allowed to come back. Well, okay. what well we, we could also write into our policy. Six weeks, you come back and get wrong again. You can now have two, two situations, even though you're asymptomatic and running forward. Uh, the NFL is looking at that now where they're finding that those who get the much larger individuals, the But we'll, we'll research it. The interest of the athlete is what we need to look at. That Absolutely. Right. The student, it, may be, it may be extremely disturbing to them, but, and they may not understand it, the parent may not understand it, but it's, it's what we need to do them to get a look at that. Maybe get medical advice and, and find out. Maybe two concussions, maybe it's three concussions. Maybe we don't know what we need to look at. Right. So we'll be moving forward with that. I just didn't want to wait until we had a policy in place to deal with the issue. That's all I have. Any other questions or comments on these items? Old business? Any board member have any additional old business that we need to bring up? Okay, new business? I have none. Any new business? Okay. Uh, public presentation on any item?
Okay, besides the semantics of how far they're walking, I think the issue is one of the school district is no longer providing transportation to and from the school in Birdsboro, for example, anyone within a one-mile radius. So at the end of the day, our responsibility isn't, we don't have a responsibility to deliver that child into the hands of their parents if they're walking home. Whereas if we have a bus company, they do have a responsibility. There's a liability issue there. And because we're delivering the transport, we're providing the transportation. We're providing those services to make sure that child gets from the school door to the home door safely. And I think that's the liability exposure that's there for both the busing companies and the school district. So that's what we're trying to address. I mean, don't parse my words like that, Shane. I'm, at the end of the day, we can't offer personal escorts for kids that are walking to school. I mean, I mean, what you're asking is is an impossible task for us. So, you know, at the end of the day, we, we have to deal within the constraints that we deal in and and control the things that we can control. We can control when a kid gets dropped off by a bus at the house and a parent isn't there and the kid is between, you know, kindergarten, first, or second grade. We can control what happens in that circumstance, and therefore we can do something about it. We can't control what happens when a kid walks from, you know, the high school or the elementary school to their house. I mean, there's, there's no way for us to control that. Okay. Okay. I think it's an excellent idea. It's an excellent idea. We will, Mr. Matz, tomorrow morning you and I need to talk. Mr. McCollum, after I talk to these ladies, then we'll talk. Yeah, you've got to talk to the people, don't you? We've had that on for a while, but. Um, that's that's a group effort, so and the other thing that I see do is I don't remember being on before which is nice on the first page where you're listing when the next meeting is held. How many I think that's nice. We could continue to do that Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your comments. We appreciate them. Especially positive feedback. Seeing none, motion to adjourn. Second, this meeting's adjourned. Thank you. Nine oh five. So much for braggers who told me we're going to set a record here tonight. What? Yeah, but you got to make sure that was good. Got some good stuff done tonight. You have to check to see if they, you know what I mean. Parents says I want my kid to play, but I don't want to do that. We'll save time and executive now. Andrew, I'm, 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 I'm